Thanks uh, for having me. I'd like to thank Strata for accepting this talk. Um, I think the point I'm going to drive home today is that while machine learning is great, it solves many problems, in many ways as, they, as the models become more predictive, they become what a lot of people call as black boxes. So, you know, inputs in and then a prediction out. So um, in a number of domains, actually the explanations um, sometimes are just as important as the prediction, and sometimes more important. Um, and I'll, I'll share some examples as to why. Whoa, I went way far. Okay, so um, a brief outline for the talk. I'll, um, I'll have a brief introduction on machine learning. Um, it's gonna get maybe slightly technical, so just feel free to ask questions or stop if there's uh, any uncertainties there. Um, I'll talk about uh, uh, explanations, sort of where they, um, how they're generated, where, um, where the um, uh, histories come from, where they've been you know, first developed, um, to where kind of state of the art is today, and some examples of those. So uh, I'll also give some, uh, actually two quick examples of how to generate these um, explanations um, on the global and on a local scale uh, in your model. And then I will uh, describe some of the common pitfalls. So it's actually um, fairly straightforward. The demo I'll show is maybe 10 or 12 lines of Python to generate explanations, but um, it's never that simple. You know, there's a lot of um, caveats that come into play when you're actually generating uh, explainable machine learning. And then uh, some of the strategies that we've developed um, at Flowcast to make, the, to make the explanations actually more intuitive. So intuitive is kind of the key metric um, that we're trying to strive for. So uh, who here ha has actually performed, like has done machine learning or is a data scientist? Okay, so the vast majority, so that's great. So this will be you know, fairly straightforward. Um, machine learning essentially is approximating the world through evidence, right? So at very low dimensionality, it looks like curve fitting, and that's really what it is. Um, wh when we talk about generalizability, we're really trying to predict areas of your, um, of your face space of data where data is actually sparse, um, may, might even be non-existent, although it's hard, generally it's gonna be hard to tell how performant that model is gonna be, but around areas where data is fairly sparse, we can, you know, w with some testing, we can kind of tell how well that model is generalizing. Overfitting essentially means that you're fitting your model to noise as opposed to actual signal. Uh, in terms of definition, just hyperparameters, I'll, I'll be using those. Those are just parameters of the model. And generally, like, there's many inputs to an ML model, right? We can deal with tens of thousands, I mean, sometimes more, even in the financial uh, sector, which is where Flowcast is positioned. But elsewhere, like with image uh, classification or with video analysis, you know, these inputs are literally pixels. Okay, so um, what I mean by curve fitting, machine learning, right? So you have some data and you're trying to create a prediction in your y-axis. And there's many different ways to fit uh, a curve to this data, right? Um, you can see some of the curves are doing uh, better at generalizing. Some of them are fitting to kind of the noise. That's obviously gonna be inherent in every data set that you have. And, um, and wh what's important to take um, notice of here is that all these models can, you know, it's easy to visualize, but when you're dealing with many, many um, uh, dimension, high dimensional data, it, it becomes harder and harder to actually tell how much overfitting you are just by looking at it. Of course, there are many testing methods that can be done. And at the end of the day, your explanations that you're gonna generate off these models are only as good as your, um, as your, predict, as your ML model in terms of how well it's predicting, whether it's over or underfitting. So this is um, the analogous classification, um, uh, you know, kind of simple example. You have binary classes and you want to fit a classifier. So you want to classify these dots, whether they're green or red. Um, in classification, of course, then therefore you're trying to segregate the classes as much as possible, so decrease the entropy. So um, here, this is a linear, what we call linear boundary. So that essentially just means you can draw a line to it. These are the simplest types of ML models you can generate. Um, we'll, we generally, you talk about complexity, how complex a model is. For a linear model, you can define this using two coefficients, right? The, the y-intercept um, and then the, the slope. So its complexity is two. Um, this, this particular model is doing actually a fairly good job of separating the classes. Now, if we go to a more complex model, 
uh, one that's you know curvy. This is now defined as a nonlinear model. Um, this you know to to actually write the equation down, you probably need a number of coefficients. Maybe you're doing some sort of uh, sum of power series or something. Um, and now is where we get to the domain of what when you know executives people talk, they call these black box models. And that sounds scary. At the end of the day, it's really just a curvy a decision boundary. This one is doing uh, better at classification, right? So the predictive power and how well it generalizes is much better. And here, um, as you increase complexity of your model, you are going to be overfitting. And this is just an extreme example. Um, what you're seeing here is a model that's way more complex than the previous one, right? This you know, requires many more uh, coefficients to define. And you see these little pockets um, where it's just overfitting to single data points. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but when you think about which case you'd rather be in, whether you're in the overfitting or underfitting case, generally you want to be in the overfitting case and then try to pull back because you're essentially try, you're capturing a lot of the signal in, the, in your data. And you're really just overfitting, uh, you're, you're having errors in just a couple spots. Whereas if you're underfitting, generally you might be missing a whole lot of signal. But this is still not the optimal you know, regime to be in. Okay, so at, at its core, uh, when you break down what machine learning is, you have structured, uh, numeric, non-null uh, data that you're inputting. You, have, you input into an ML algorithm, and then you output a set of predictions. So given a, a complex case, let's say <clears throat> an image classifier, an image that's 256 by 256, uh, RGB has 200K inputs, right? So every RGB value. You input into an image classifier, let's say um, AlexNet, and then you get uh, a set of predictions. And this is my son, for anyone's curious. <laughs> okay, so I want to move now to why explanations actually are important. <coughs> so you have a set of input data, and here let's let's imagine we're going to the hospital, and uh, we are get we got tested with some vital signs. And there's a robot doctor. You know, maybe it's like the first screen, or you know, let's say this is 100 years in the future, and you just have you literally have robot doctors. <coughs> and the prediction of the model says you're going to die in the next 24 hours. So great, you know, it was accurate, <laughs> and you're dead. <laughs> okay, so the model did what it was told to do. However, what was actually as important, maybe more so important, is what were the factors that led to that prediction? You know, what, what were the uh, top reasons? So as an example, um, uh, the explanations are going to be grabbed from the input data itself, right? These are your vital signs. And these were the top three reasons why the model thinks you're gonna die. Okay, so that's actually one, <clears throat> one of the key um, requirements is we, need the uh, explanations coming from the inputs themselves. <coughs> and um, beyond that, the, <coughs> the prediction is fixed and the model is fixed. So we're, we're trying to explain models that already exist. They're already in production. Maybe they're highly complex. Um, Taking tons, you know, they're very performant, making millions of dollars. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, mess around with the exist. We don't want to mess around with the model, train a new model. We want to be explaining existing models in production. And what that means is, therefore, the model's fixed and the prediction's fixed. I want to start with probably uh, anyone that's trained random forest or any tree-based ensemble models probably has done this. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, get global explanations. You can look at the feature importances. This is essentially a ranked order of how often these features appear in your model and weighted to the ones that are closer to the, um, to the um, root, essentially. The ones that are splitting you know, for the uh, uh, higher up in each decision tree. The problem with global explanations is they're global. They are static. They don't, it doesn't matter what your actual uh, inputs are for each prediction. So let's try to move forward and look at local explanations. I want to compare kind of, or contrast the two different types of models that you generally are looking at, <clears throat> linear, nonlinear models. 
So in terms of complexity, linear models, you know, fairly light. Nonlinear, um, highly complex, right? It could be a function of um, many different types of splines or whatever, how, however you may, you know, visualize it. You know, high, highly dimensional, this is obviously in 3D, but, you know, in general, these can be in hundreds of thousands of dimensions. So when you look at, when you're trying to piece together what a local explanation might look like, um, for the linear case, it's essentially uh, the coefficient size, right? Because it's the same everywhere. Your, your impact of every feature is the same at any place in your phase space of where you are in data, uh, in your data, uh, you know, your, your uh, data set, let's say. So it doesn't capture any dynamics, right? Your linear model is essentially uh, just a, a, a sum of coefficients times the, the feature. Whereas in a nonlinear model, um, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, different curvatures that appear in your, um, uh, that are going to appear in your model, and therefore you, you can't just, you know, there, there is no singular coefficient. But what you can do, and what, um, actually let me go here, what, what a lot of um, algorithms that are generate explanations do is they take a, the local area where, where you are in your um, input, your input prediction. So going back to that um, hospital case, you know, you're, you take your vital inputs and you appear here now in your data, whereas all, you know, this is all the other samples of data. And the model is highly nonlinear. And what the explanations do, like Lime or Shapely or, um, or uh, sensitivity analysis, is they essentially take a local interpretation. What does that mean? Is they, they take a gradient of that at that surface. That's all it really is. And there's different ways to take a gradient of surfaces. Oops. Yeah. Um, let me go back to uh, another way that actually you don't really, you're not really taking a gradient, but you are still taking a local interpretation is, is what's called sensitivity analysis. So going back to this, this is all um, as well a nonlinear curve. And what you do is you just vary your inputs a little bit, right, by a little delta, and you see how much your prediction varies. And you can do this for every single feature. And as you vary each um, input by a slight amount, you see how sensitive your prediction is to that value. So for example, if you're up here, moving, um, you know, right in the middle, moving your x value by a little bit, it's not gonna change your prediction at all, a, a lot, right? So, so the prediction's not sensitive at that point. So we're again talking about a local interpretation of, um, of your model. Over here, um, when you actually compute, you know, because there's a, th this kind of combined, I don't know, duplet of data, here also you vary x a little bit and you're not gonna see a change in your uh, prediction by much. This is another straightforward way to calculate a local interpretation of, um, of your model. But uh, another way that I actually wanna get into a demo because it's, it's fairly, Really straightforward, not a lot of code, is um, is is essentially using Lime. So Lime is uh, locally interpretable model estimation. What it's doing is essentially sampling around your prediction point and then just training a new linear model at that point. So it's another way of calculating a gradient of um, of the of your machine learning model at the point of prediction. And uh, the beauty of it is it has a Python package. Actually, a lot of these have Python packages. So, it's, uh, so let's go through that. So we'll do a little live code, I guess. So uh, what I'm loading here is the, um, it's adult.data. Essentially, it's a data set that tries to predict whether you're a low or high income earner given some you know, inputs. And I'll show you some of the features that are, that are used here. So some of the features that are used are like your age, you know, your education, um, you know, how many hours per, per week you work, and then the label here at the end is, is your income. And it's a, it's a binary, class, um, binary data set, so essentially it's whether you're, you're earning less or greater than 50K a year. So we'll do some, uh, some pre-processing. So of course, with any kind of ML model, you have to, um, uh, you know, vectorize your, your um, uh, uh, what are those called? You have to uh, label and code your, sorry, not label and code, your categorical features, yeah, sorry. So what that essentially means is you have a, a vector of categories and you just, one, you, one way to do this is you want hot encode them. There's other ways, but when you, after you do this, you get, you know, every row transforms into, um, 
the feature plus whether it was, uh, you know, work class private, never work, et cetera. And with a value of one, that's why it's one hot encoded um, for the value of that particular row. So now our data set's numeric. Okay, these are the, the categories in case. And we're already ready to train our model. So let's build some random forests and then look at the model importances. Okay, so from the random forest without really any hyperparameters besides the number of trees, we see that the um, future importances that it felt were, uh, were the greatest impact are age and hours per week, uh, capital gain. So it seems like fairly you know, straightforward, like it's believable. Now let's go to um, XGBoost. Yeah. So again, the only hyperparameter is number of trees here, or number of estimators, 300. Okay, so it's done. Uh, we all, I, in the background, there was a train test split, and here's the confusion matrix. So for the random force, it's 85% uh, accurate. For the um, XGBoost, it's 87. That, that's as much, I don't want to go into details of like building a performant model, but let's just say that we believe the XGBoost is doing a little bit better than the random forest. Now, if we go to its uh, model importances, we see a, a whole different set of uh, global importances, right? Now, it believes um, whether you're a, uh, a married civilian spouse is the most important. If you're a managerial occupation, highly important as well, right? So we're getting kind of conflicting, uh, highly conflicting um, global explanations. And that's really related to how the model is fitting, right? It doesn't, it's not really relating to the curvature of the model itself. So here in this uh, block right here, um, we, we create, we instance a Lime uh, explainer and it utilizes the training data. And then now this is the output. So let me just go through what, what we're seeing here. So we pick a, just a random, you know, ith value of the test set, right? And we, inst and we show an explanation. So what this is saying is that for this ith value, this was the prediction, right? I was 100% probability that this, um, this uh, prediction, or sorry, this input is uh, greater than 50K of income. And these are the top reasons for that, for, for, um, for this. So the, the greatest reason is that this um, individual had a capital gain greater than zero. And, and here's the actual value. So they have, you know, some capital gains, I guess that is highly important for causing this um, uh, input to have a high prediction of 50K or more for high, um, high income. And then uh, moving on, uh, marital status, they're married. Um, they have uh, quite a lot of education and um, their uh, age is greater than 48. So a bit, I wouldn't say a bit old, but. Okay, let's, let's try another one. So. Here's conversely an input where um, the uh, the actual prediction was was uh, not in the not in this bucket. So essentially, a, a low income individual. And what were the reasons here? Well, the top top one again was capital gain. Actually, so uh, capital gain value of zero. That's why you know that's the greatest one. And marital status never married. This person's quite young, 19 uh, years old. Uh, probably still going through their education, right? So actually from here, let's see if capital gain appeared in the global um, importances. Now with Lime, I'm actually explaining the XGBoost classifier, right? However, I don't see capital gain. Oh, uh, I see capital loss, but yeah, I don't see capital gain here. Oh wait, sorry, there it is. I'm blind. It's the fourth one, right? So it's not the top one. So at a global scale, which is, could be biased by your data set, uh, there's you know, a, host of num a host of other reasons why uh, this tree-based model is, is is, it, is um, thinking or learning that that these three are are the you know features are at the top of the decision trees. However, through Lime, what we're seeing a local representation that capital gains actually, you know, at least for the, for these two examples, it's going to change for the others, of course. But for those two examples, it's the most important. Um, and then for the uh, random forest capital gain as well is on the third. It's not it's not the first two. Okay, and then just the last um, example here. So here's one that's a little bit mixed. So you have a prediction that is, um, you know, still uh, is predicting a low income individual, but not as strongly. So it's only 64%. 
expectation, and you see the explanations are, are as well mixed, right? So there's, there's kind of evidence for either one. For example, they have no capital gains as well, but their, um, their marital status is, uh, is married, right, with the, um, with the spouse. So, so essentially, there's, there's kind of like this conflicting, you know, um, for like another one, hours per week is 50, right? They're working quite a bit. So there's some, some uh, conflicting explanations, and that, and that comes into also why the score is, is uh, not as, not, doesn't have as a high value, like it's not 100%. Let's go back. Okay. Okay. So we've at Flowcast actually implemented Lime, uh, and we we you know built a, a bar you know a, a box or whatever bar graph that shows you know whether an explanation is going or uh, sorry feature is going to explain a prediction towards you know one direction of the class of binary classification or the other direction. And um, in, pr in actual practice, when we deliver this to our uh, customers, uh, oh, and, and let me uh, uh, back up a little bit. So we, we're providing uh, machine learning models to uh, banking clients. So these are predicting credit risk and fraud risk and things like that. So this is in the financial space. So you're going to see a lot of features that look you know, financial in nature. But that, that domain uh, doesn't, doesn't matter too much as, a, as much as when you, when you sh show this to you know, a bunch of people that aren't in you know, data science, they're going to scratch their heads a lot of times. This is, this is quite complex. And even for me, when I'm reading this, it takes me probably like, I don't know, 15 minutes to get in the, in the right mindset of like, how do you read this? What does it mean to be, you know, very red or like a little blue? But this is the same thing that the demo was showing just at a, at a I would say at a real scale. And the, the reason it's real is because we deal with many more features than we're in that kind of play data set, right? We're dealing with hundreds, if not thousands, of features for our models. Um, and what you see is we, we, we see features that are, you would think are highly correlated, right? They have, like, for example, tenor and fin tenor. I mean, they have tenor in the name. You think those were, should be highly correlated, but you see that they're on opposite ends here. Um, there's, there's a number of other features here that are highly correlated as well. But this is the literal output of, um, of Lime. So how can we make this more intuitive, right? We, we're trying to make this readable, uh, human readable, and not just by data scientists, by, but by um, product users. So let me, let me um, dive first into the uh, correlations. So we, we, you know, when you're building models, generally, you know, you, you want to take the correlations out. Um, you can, uh, th there's higher order dependence as well that you might miss. And along with that, um, uh, correlations can, can occur in unexpected ways as well that you may not be able to decorrelate. So when you look at, at you know, these kind of fake features, sure, you can group you know, some of these, these time series features uh, into, three, into these three buckets and then just decor, you know, do a PCA on them and then create a new feature that's uh, you know, essentially like the, let, let's call it like the first you know, vector of, of PCA for like health expenses, right? Uh, and the same for the others, but what you're going to see is that uh, for example, your age uh, is also correlated with all, with all of these, right? So how do you de how do you decorrelate these three kind of separately because these are three separate intuitive features, but how, but include age as well, um, zip code as well uh, is going to be correlated with with a number of these things as well, right? So so a lot of these features, especially in finance or in healthcare, are um, are are correlated. And then the other thing I want to uh, mention is that the uh, cor correlated features can dilute the actual importance, right? So if you had, let's say, 100 of these features and one of age, well, 100 of these, well, the, the, as the model is building these decision trees, it can pick any one, right, if, if the correlation is, is very high. It can pick any one. So when you actually look at the feature importances or when you look at Lyme as well, it's, just, you know, it's the same story. You're going to see um, those features are going to have fairly small uh, importances. When you actually um, decor or combine those features into like a like a, like one feature, let's say um, that captures ninety five percent of the uh, variance of of those hundred, then their feature explanation becomes uh, more comparable to some of these other ones that are not grouped in that similar way. Um, 
going back to not, we, we don't want to build a new model for explanations. We want to use existing performant models. So you might say, well, out of those 100, why don't you just pick like three or two or something? Well, the idea is that um, those 100, w although there, there can be some high correlation within them, we might be decorrelating them in other ways or doing some other feature um, uh, generation on those. We don't want to generate a new model and that only has, let's say, like one sal you know, previous salary feature, one net worth feature. We want to be explaining um, models that are, that are existing. And in, in ways of grouping this, actually, we take a human approach, or we're not automating that, because at the end of the day, if you need to group, like, you know, out of a thousand features, like, into 10 or 20 uh, buckets, we can do that by hand, you know, we, it's, it's not like you have to do this every day, you just do this for every model. So one, one technique um, is you do a, you know, you look at a correlation uh, plot, and it's hard to tell what these features are, uh, but that, that part doesn't matter. What, what you're looking at here is just a correlation of each feature with, every, with everyone else, and you could try to group you know, ones that are correlated and ones that are intuitively similar. And you take the cumulative feature impact um, from Lime. Yes? Oh, like anti-correlation? Yeah, um, you can still combine them and just take maybe, maybe there's, instead of the loss, there's a gain, so you might change, you know, the meaning of that feature to be the negative of it, and then you can still combine them. Because if, if they're highly anti-correlated, that means they're still very dependent on each other. Of course, it doesn't mean that one's causing another, but that doesn't, we're not talking about causality here at all. We're just talking about if there's any sort of dependence. And, and the other downside with um, uh, correlations is it's only a linear dependence, and there could be higher order dependence um, as well. You, we don't see those pop up too often, but you know, theoretically, there's, there's higher order dependence that we're, you know, this is completely missing. Okay, so this is an example of what we do is, um, what I was just talking about is we take the top end uh, features from Lime. Mm. Sorry, this is going ahead. <clears throat> so, so we group the features into, um, into like groups and we uh, do, do PCA, grab the first component and that's your new feature. Now uh, from Lime, so, this is, run this through Lime, and now you have a set of feature importances. Now the next thing that we've done to make this more intuitive is we do a comparison to the peer group. So one of the things is um, you can give a set of explanations like in the, the robot doctor uh, uh, example where you have, you know, your, your blood pressure is this, right? But it, what if you compare that to the peer group? It, it takes it the next, you know, that one step extra to make it more intuitive. So instead of saying your, blood, your um, heart rate is 100, you can say your heart rate is 100, but your peer group's heart rate uh, is 50, and you're in the top 95th percentile. So you're doing a comparison to, uh, to a data set related to your peer group, and peer could be, mean a lot of things. That's also a human developed uh, uh, thing. Here, um, peer group would, for example, be like your industry, maybe your, your market cap, uh, could be your, the country, right, that, that these, uh, in, these businesses are a part of. So your peer group is kind of, uh, it really depends, you know, on the health side it could be like an age bracket or something like that. And when you have that piece, so when you've done, when you've done that comparison to the peer group, then you can, you can uh, auto-generate plain text sentences. So for example here, um, you can say that, you know, the, for the first explanation, the prediction for credit worsened by, by its value because cost of sales is in the top 20% uh, historically. So the, the cost of sales is, is quite high. And as an example, so we provide um, uh, credit risk models. This is a, a model where um, the risk was very high uh, to, to lend or to finance. And uh, uh, risk bucket five is, is the greatest one that we have. And these were the explanations that were uh, auto-generated based on the model and on that input data. So the a PD being the probability of default is increased because the debt to assets in the top 10 percentile. So again, debt, you know, debt to asset ratio, very important. But this is essentially going right to you know, what the um, most important factors were and with the comparison. This is quite different than what I had shown before, which was kind of our first generation of um, 
this was our first generation of explanations that we had done. You know, the information is, is grabbed from here, but it's kind of taking it to, to the next step of trying to make it more intuitive. Okay. So uh, key takeaways. So explainability is, is very much needed when root, ca root cause analysis is critical to, to your domain. So it's not needed everywhere, of course, um, but to a lot of domains such as in, in finance for regulatory purposes for healthcare, because we wanna understand why uh, a model is making a certain prediction. For self-driving cars, we wanna understand why the image classifier um, says there's a stop sign, but there isn't, right? Wanna, wanna understand like, like, it's like fault tolerance. So uh, explanation is becoming very important for these types of use cases. And, and I see that it's becoming more and more, uh, more and more uh, valuable and, um, and interesting. Now with that, as time goes on, our machine learning models are becoming more and more complex. Right? I talked about single models. You could think of stacked models or ensemble models. For an, ex for, um, an explanation algorithm to work, it doesn't matter what your model is, right? It, the model, you treat it as a black box and you're really just kind of you know, peering into a testing. Like a sensitivity analysis, think about just like varying you know, features and seeing the sensitivity of each feature at, at that point of prediction. It doesn't really matter what that black box is. It could be 100 stacked models, right? <clears throat> so it has to be, um, uh, it has to be usable for a, as complex of a model as you can imagine. Because as time goes on, these models are becoming more and more complex. And what we've, what we've noticed when we've actually deployed our explanations is that uh, intuitiveness is very important. It's, it's just as important as the, as the accuracy of the explanation. So if you send you know, just a, a whole list of 100 ranked features for every prediction, no one's really gonna know how to see it. I can barely, you know, I have to get into the right mindset of understanding what it means. Um, so making an, an intuitive, you know, uh, or converting that output to something that's more intuitive is, is extreme, we found is extremely important for, for the usability of these. And then the other thing is, um, as you do a literature search, you know, explainable machine learning is, is truly an open research topic. Uh, we collaborate with a lab in Berkeley that is, you know, five computer science professors and, and a whole host of grad students that are getting funding, and they're in explanations machine learning lab. They're not even machine learning, just explanations. So it really truly is a, an open research topic and it's really hard to predict where we're gonna be in five years, if, there's gonna, if we're going more towards you know, more accurate algorithms or, or um, just more usable explanations. So uh, really do, you know, if you dive into this field, expect, expect things to change, especially if you're, applying the, if you're applying these. So just a little bit about ourselves. We're uh, a seed stage startup founded in San Francisco. Um, we have um, essentially uh, uh, done work with, with a lot of these uh, f uh, big banks and financial institutions to help them understand their, um, their clients that they finance a bit better, right? So um, helping them uh, surface their best clients and, um, uh, and finding, finding risk where they hadn't seen risk before. So I'd like to thank you and just also add that we are hiring um, in SF. So if you, um, if you are or if you know of someone that is um, you know, Python engineer, data scientist, data engineer, or an ML engineer, uh, please, please uh, let me know either here or at, at my email. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Oh, and then the last slide, yeah. So uh, rate, you know, rate this session, rate all the sessions you guys have been at. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, how, if they can be locally linear? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So for example, if, if they're not continuous, for example, um, you can think of like a step, a step function. It's not going to be, uh, you, you can't fit uh, a single, you know, or the great, in other words, the gradient is, um, is two different values where they're approaching from one side or the other. Yeah, well, so, like yeah, so, so a lot of the, when you're generating these explanations, actually you're not, you're not um, solving for what the analytical function is of the ML model, 
but you do require that it is continuous through all your phase space. In general, when you're building models such as um, you know neural networks or or these um, you know random forests or whatever tree-based ensembles, you you kind of get I wouldn't say you're guaranteed, but you're essentially guaranteed that it's going to be continuous because of the way that these algorithms are trained, you know, you have all these like continuous like arithmetic or you have all these arithmetic um, function. Uh, um, you know, arithmetic functions as you, as you go through the neural network. But, but when you're calculating a gradient, you know, of any kind of curvature, you do require that that, that curve is continuous. Yeah. You can perhaps use like some kind of surrogate on top of that mm. on, on your model. Well, I mean, these models are, tend to be quite regularized anyway. So yeah. You have a, I, I would say it's relatively reasonable to have a relatively smooth manifold locally. Yes. I, that, that's the idea is that like, if you zoom in far enough, like with any surface and, and including these, it's going to look, the surface is going to look linear again. And that's what sensitivity analysis is actually doing. Is that's how you're picking that delta. You're picking that delta small enough so that the surface looks linear. Other questions? Any? No? Shapley, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. So there, there isn't. And I, I, w when we've run these, the plain text uh, examples from the, the last few slides, those are using sh uh, Shapley, actually, not Lime. But it, at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter from my perspective. Um, they're both, I, I, th I think our data scientist that's working on this does, uh, did say that the Shapley uh, algorithm does take faster to run because you're not, training, uh, you're, you're not training a new linear model every time you need to run it. Um, it is doing, but, but it does explode with a number of features you have. So I think there's an approximation that, you, that the algorithm is doing in Shapley. But at the end of the day, um, all you're really doing is a pro taking a local linear approximation of your model manifold. And there's, there's a whole host of ways you can do that today. I imagine there's going to be a whole host of new ways you can do that tomorrow. For us, it's really not, not how accurate that local linear interpretation is. It's how intuitive you can make the output, and, and of course, in an automated way. So when you perform sentiment, uh, sensitivity analysis, so there could be these correlations, right, that could also impact. So how do you yes. that? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. So when you do a sensitivity analysis, there can be correlations that will also dilute the impact of the you know, core feature. So it's the same with any of, of the algorithm, whether you're doing um, uh, um, sensitivity analysis or Lime or Shapely. When you have all these, let's say you have 100 correlated features, the algorithm can pick any one and it's going to dilute. So what we do is we group the outputs of the, essentially you do the sensitivity of all of them, and you group the ones that you, you know, from, from a human perspective, you think are all related to each other into one kind of core group, and you can sum them up or sum their impacts up. Yeah. Question over there. So you don't really need uh, data. The points are on that area. Do you have some kind of So if you're doing sensitivity analysis, you don't need any data. You, you're just varying features, like features by little deltas around your prediction. With Lime, you, you do because you are actually fitting, it, it's fitting a linear model each time. And with Shapely, I forget, with, I, I don't think you need data, but I have to check because I actually don't know. However, with the comparison to the peer group, what we do is we um, calculate that with, when we train the model. So when we train a model, we have all these you know, kind of peer groups and we pre-calculate you know, the percentile value. So like 10, 20, 30 percentile. So that when we're now generating explanations, there's, let's say, this long you know, JSON of, of um, uh, you know, cutoffs or whatever. And it says, OK, you're in the 90th percent. You, OK, so it says you're, this feature is, um, you know, is the first, exp first impact, you know, most impactful. And it's in the 90th percentile of your peer group. So, um, so that's kind of the combination at the very end with, uh, with how the sentence gets generated. Yes, with, your, with the peer group. Yeah, exactly, yes. So it's not just like a peer group in the model space, but it's a peer group that we are defining, yes. So that's more, again, like the human intervention as opposed to something that comes purely from the data from the model. That's right. I'm afraid we've run out of time for questions. If we can thank the speaker again, it's great talk.